This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. NASA has spent weeks preparing to launch its Artemis One rocket. It will be a key first step in US efforts to embark on a manned mission to the moon in 2025. Yeah, yeah, been there, done that. But this mission has two big new things. One is that it's committed to putting the first woman and first person of color on the moon. And two is that NASA is planning to use info from this mission to prepare for a future mission to Mars. But even getting off the ground has taken a little while. On Monday, NASA had to roll back the rocket launch ahead of an expected hit from Hurricane Ian later this week. But it's the latest in years of backups. Planning for the Artemis mission began in 2017 and was originally scheduled for a late 2021 launch. It's also the first launch that will use NASA's Space Launch System, or SLS. The SLS has been in development since 2011 and was required by Congress to launch in December of 2016, but an array of delays have pushed it to potentially late 2022. The launch was set to go in late August, but was delayed again and again due to problems with fuel leaks. The culprit? Liquid hydrogen. NASA has used an extremely cold, liquefied version of hydrogen to power SLS rockets in the Artemis program. You've got combustion reactions that are taking place. The combustion reaction is being used to propel space vehicles into space. If you have pure hydrogen, then the energy density is going to be higher. Jim Brenner, an engineering professor and liquid hydrogen expert at Florida Tech, said it's a decision that broke from what private spaceflight firms like SpaceX and Blue Origin have done. NASA chose hydrogen over natural gas like methane or kerosene because they decided to prioritize using a more powerful fuel over being able to reuse their rockets. But because of the extreme and very specific conditions needed to store hydrogen, it comes with a big challenge. The challenge is when you're storing very cold liquids, uh, the temperature associated with that can make the metal uh, containment brittle. The temperature for liquid hydrogen is way, way below room temperature, and that is the biggest problem. Hydrogen can be pretty sneaky, and when it comes in contact with a metal surface, it can break down into atoms, make the metal more brittle, and diffuse its way to the other side. Artemis, in this case, was somewhat of an unlucky situation, but uh, it's not the first time, and it won't be the last time, that NASA's had problems with hydrogen, uh, liquid hydrogen. Uh, it, it's part of the problem. Last Wednesday, Artemis passed a major hurdle when NASA's launch teams found that they met all of their objectives in cryogenic testing. Liquid hydrogen leaked at a small enough level that allowed them to move forward. But why is this a problem for NASA? Space.com editor-in-chief Tarek Malik told us NASA uses hydrogen because the agency is recycling old parts from the space shuttle that work best with hydrogen. It's a new vehicle, and NASA is is kind of putting it together from spare parts from the space shuttle era, so they needed to make sure that they took these old engines. The engines that are on Artemis 1 are the ones that powered the space shuttle. Although they, they used, um, uh, they, they're using four on, on the core booster, they used five on the space shuttle, and they changed how they work with new controllers. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that had to be tested all by itself that added to these delays. Now, a lot of NASA's limitations are set into laws that specifically outline what the programs can and can't use. When the space launch system was approved, it was approved by Congress. And so it's written into law that NASA will build a rocket that will be, you know, this tall and use these types of engines and use these boosters from the space shuttle and be built in these different places. That really adds a lot of limitations to what NASA can do to cut costs, to get things done faster. A big issue here is what is known as cost plus contracting. In essence, the government pays a contractor a sum, but also agrees to still pay for cost overruns and unanticipated costs. NASA used that approach in the building of the SLS program, and administrators in the agency are raising the red flag. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson testified earlier this year that cost plus contracts were a plague on the agency. And former NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver 
told us she thinks it's constrained NASA's ability to keep up with private spaceflight companies. NASA's way of contracting is similar to what is done at the Pentagon with what we call cost plus contracting. And that means that a company is really not incentivized to reduce the costs or even do their projects within a set period of time because delays just mean you get paid more for longer periods of time. And what I describe in the book as a self-licking ice cream cone is the result of Congress getting told by industry, you know, we can keep these jobs in your districts if you support these programs. But as we saw with the delay this week, factors well beyond the rocket can cause delays. Even when technical issues are fixed, weather can play a role. So let's figure out a bit more about the new timetable and how the impending storm affects NASA's plans. Newsy national correspondent Clayton Sandell has been covering the launch prep for a while and knows this inside and out. So we're bringing him in to help us unpack some of this. Clayton, uh, what's the latest here? How is this storm affecting NASA's plans? And when might we see this rocket back on the launch pad and heading towards space? Hey, Christian. Well, unfortunately, the third time will not be the charm for Artemis 1. That mission to moon orbit and back, of course, relies on the most powerful rocket ever built, the giant SLS carrying the Orion capsule on top. It's supposed to be a test flight without astronauts, but unfortunately, they've already had to scrub twice because of liquid hydrogen fuel leaks. Why is that a big deal? Well, you remember back to 1937 and the Hindenburg disaster? Well, that German airship was filled with hydrogen that caught fire. So it's not something you want to mess around with. However, NASA had said they were ready to try again Tuesday morning. But as smart as NASA engineers are, there is nothing they can do about the weather. And the threat from Hurricane Ian is forcing them to roll the rocket back inside. Now remember, it's a big rocket, 322 feet tall, taller than the Statue of Liberty. Not a great idea to expose it to hurricane force winds. So they will roll it back. It's about a four mile journey and it takes a while, anywhere from eight to 12 hours. But NASA believes it is the safest route to protect its very large, very expensive rocket ship. So the next launch attempt is looking like either late October or probably into November. NASA hasn't said yet. All right, many thanks to Clayton for getting us up to speed on humanity's latest attempt to reach the final frontier.